Greetings all! Welcome to the next part of the Black Crusade, the 13th. The storm breaks. As part of the constant vigil around the Eye of Terror, highly trained units of Kasserkin were pushed into the swirling maelstrom, desperate to find some indication of where the first blow would land. Astropathic divination pointed towards the blighted world of Earthwart, where a massive force was believed to be gathering. Earthwart was a world taken by chaos, its population enslaved and sacrificed to the dark gods. The Kasserkin found nothing alive on Earthwart, merely death and hideous plague zombies infected with the curse of unbelief. But as the Kasserkin prepared to withdraw, frantic Vox communication from their ships in orbit reported numerous vessels advancing on Earthwart from the Eye of Terror. As the Kasserkin fell back to their dropships and attempted to return to their carriers, but it was already too late. The Imperial ships were either crippled or had been forced to disengage and make for Cadia. There was to be no escape, and the Cadians were stranded on Earthwart as a massive vessel, larger than the most gargantuan capital ship, approached them. The Planet Killer. Oblivious to their fate, the Cadians could do nothing, as the incomprehensible power of the planet killer was unleashed in a devastating lance of energy that bored through the planet's crust and sundered the very bedrock. The land split, and the planet's core exploded, breaking Ulthwart into spinning pieces of molten rock. The death of Ulthwart echoed in the warp, blowing out the encroaching warp storms, and every telepath within a thousand light years felt its death scream. As Ulthwart collapsed in on itself, a chaos fleet of hundreds of warships and hulking transports surged from the depths of the Eye of Terror towards Cadia. The diseased Plague Claw and Terminus Est, along with a massive flotilla of Plague Hulks, emerged in the Subacchio Diablo system and began heading deep into the pestilence-wracked sector. Alongside the Chaos Fleet, and guarded by the Despoiler-class battleships, Merciless Death, and Fortress of Agony, came two hideously altered black stone fortresses, where once they had served the Imperium as naval bases, they now resembled twisted and mutated cathedrals dedicated only to blood and death. Naval patrols, forewarned by the surviving astropaths on Belisar, fell back before the tide of corrupted vessels, desperately calling for aid from neighboring sectors the ban on transit between sectors was still in force, and the precious hours were wasted as naval captains fought to overcome the bureaucracy of the Officio Medicae, who attempted to prevent them from press-ganging their crews back into service. Those ships that could be mustered gathered in the Ormantep system, under the command of Admiral Pulaski. 
are ready to fight and die to give the defenders on Cadia whatever time they could buy with their lives. Unlike many other naval battles, there was no jockeying for advantageous position by the foes. The Chaos Fleet, obviously intended to batter its way through the Imperial Navy, and the two fleets clashed in the shadow of the Ilthurium Belt, a mineral-rich asteroid field plundered by the mining hulks of Ormantep. Battle was joined, and the horrendously outnumbered Loyalist fleet fought in the grand tradition of the Imperial Navy with courage, honor, and steadfastness. A dozen vessels were crippled in the opening moments of the battle, either by wave after wave of torpedoes or constant attack runs of doomfire bombers. But the rest of the fleet fought on, as both fleets intermingled, and the battle became a desperate close quarters engagement, with horrific damage being inflicted on both sides. A portion of the Chaos Fleet split from the main battle and surged past the heavily engaged navy towards the Agrippina sector. For long hours, the two fleets pounded one another, and all hope seemed lost when Admiral Pulaski's flagship, Honor and Duty, was destroyed in a catastrophic plasma drive explosion. The Imperial defenders had commended their souls to the Emperor when several Chaos warships that had assumed blocking positions suddenly exploded as the warships of Battlefleet Agrippina caught the Chaos Fleet off guard. Led by Admiral Krarin, the newly arrived Imperial reinforcements cleared a path for the beleaguered navy to disengage from the battle and withdraw to Deimos Binary. Quarren had saved what remained of the fleet, but in doing so, had left the way cleared for the splinter fleet of Chaos vessels to reach the defenses of the Agrippina sector. With little or nothing to prevent the Chaos ships from entering each planet's orbit, the systems of Agrippina sector were wide open to attack by the diseased followers of the Plague God. Soon, the worlds of this and the Bellus Corona subsector became nightmare visions of hell, mud, horror, and war. On Amistel Majoris, cursed plague marines of Nurgle landed and decimated much of the local defense forces before the forces of the Drokian Fingard were able to affect planet fall and bolster the embattled defenders. Plague took many hundreds of lives, and the once verdant fields of this prosperous world were reduced to desolate, corpse-choked plains, with bodies piled ten deep in every crater. Colonel Pertage orchestrated a masterful defense, devising a cunning series of trench systems to confound the foe and lead them into deadly fire traps. But the colonel never lived to see his defenses in action, as the plague struck him down before the first major engagement of the war. Space Marines from the Howling Griffins chapter fought their way through the chaos blockade, escorting the ships of the Legio Astrorum to man the defenses as the first wave of attackers struck. 
Only the Space Marines, with their blessed power armor and Titans, could survive the toxin-ridden battlefields of this plague front. And the normally lightning-fast warfare practiced by the warriors of the Adeptus Astartes bogged down into grueling trench fighting. Both sides fed their forces into the meat grinder of battle, neither willing to surrender the world to the other. On Lelithar, the originating world of the voice, Imperial Guard soldiers of the Urin Dragoons, together with warlord titans of the Legio Ignatum, landed at Gorgosa and laid siege to the captured Imperial Palace, said to be the operational headquarters of the voice. The resultant siege decimated much of Lelithar's capital city. The cost the lives of millions of people as the city's populace rose to fight the soldiers of the Imperial Guard, supported by the Death Spectres chapter. The siege continues to grind mercilessly towards an uncertain conclusion. Plague swept across the face of every world, and as many soldiers fell to disease as to the weapons of the enemy. In space, Admiral Croran led the battered fleet in a fighting retreat back to Cadia and stationed it in a defensive posture in conjunction with the three Ramillies class star forts in orbit. The Chaos fleet advanced towards Cadia stopping only to allow the Blackstone fortresses to scour Deimos binary to a barren rock. Lightning arcs of incandescent energies raised the planet's surface bare, killing millions of Imperial servants and destroying every structure in a matter of hours. Chaos vessels quickly overwhelmed the orbital defenses of Solar Martrias, the outermost planet of the Cadian system, and hundreds of dropships carrying traitor regiments of Vulcani cataphracts descended to the surface, attacking the mining outpost and capturing the valuable ore refineries from the defending units of the Cadian 23rd. Here, the trader forces established a forward base of operations from which to launch attacks throughout the system. St. Joe's Main's hope fell soon after. The inmates of this military prison rising up against their goalers as the first waves of violators, renegade space marines, attacked. Brutal close quarters fighting erupted all across the continent sized prison, and many of the guards kept a bullet for themselves rather than be taken by the frenzied inmates. Welcoming the traitor forces as liberators, the inmates were to be horrifyingly disabused of this notion as those allowed to live were instead taken as slaves for the Chaos Fleet or conscripted into its armies. Enemy ships spread throughout the Cadian system, several being picked off by shadowy Eldar vessels that vanished as mysteriously as they arrived. But the bulk of the Chaos Fleet advanced directly on Cadia. Admiral Quarren had done what he could, 
but the overwhelming chaos fleet could not be stopped, and after three days of hard fighting, the majority of his ships had been either crippled or destroyed. Those vessels that could escape fled to the forge world of Cantrell in an attempt to refit and rearm in time to make a defense. But there were precious few of them. A single Remilly's star fort fell to the invaders. The remaining two managing to overload their reactors and self-destruct before the enemy could consolidate their hold upon them. With the space around Cadia secured, orbital bombardments hammered the planet's surface. And one by one, the defense batteries were silenced. Hundreds of cargo hulks moved into orbit and disgorged swarms of landing craft that streaked through the planet's upper atmosphere. The invasion of Cadia had begun. So I guess you can imagine what comes next. The invasion of Cadia. But first, let's have a little tidbit here. Oh, we'll make this a long video. Sure, why not? Here's a little letter to Lord Inquisitor Gorodin, Ordo Xenos Nemesis Tysera, from Interrogator Kyrus, Clearance Omnicron, Subject Araman of the Thousand Suns, Priority Ultra High, Immediate Action Requested. Received in the 999th year of the 41st millennium. Message format, astropathic. Thought for the day, wisdom is the beginning of fear. Honored Inquisitor, allow me to introduce myself to you. My name is Ferdin Kyrus, a loyal servant of the God Emperor and formal pupil of Inquisitor Xevak. It has been both my pleasure and honor to serve the Honorable Inquisitor for nearly five decades in an investigative capacity, seeking out information as well as undertaking other, more esoteric, missions involving Xenos creatures. As a sign of my truth, I urge you to seek counsel from the biologus at Nemesis Tysera and verify the gene sequence data attached to this method message. But now to the substance of this missive. It is with a heavy heart I bring your attention to the disappearance of my master. I fear a, ter a terrible fate has befallen him and it was at his instruction that in such circumstances I should contact you and seek guidance. It had long been a dread to my master that the being known as Ariman of the Thousand Sons discover his whereabouts and force him to reveal hidden knowledge imparted to him by the Eldar. To fully understand the dire implications of this, I must unfortunately, reveal to you much knowledge that should best remain secret. As I am sure you are aware, Araman was once a librarian in the Thousand Suns chapter of Space Marines, and under the tutelage of his Primarch, Magnus the Red, learned much of the ways of sorcery. In time, his mastery of blasphemous magics was almost the equal of his Cyclopean Primarch, and his knowledge of forbidden lore corrupted him beyond redemption. The Thousand Sons were also tainted, and Araman realized that the Legion would soon be reduced to little more than gibbering monstrosities. He conceived a great spell to save the Legion called the Rubric of Araman. Its energies were more powerful than he could possibly have anticipated, and its effects on the Thousand Suns devastating. Only those with sorcerous powers were spared its effect, whilst the remainder of the Legion 
were reduced to dust within their sealed suits of armor, becoming little more than fighting automatons. Enraged with Ahriman's betrayal, Magnus cast him out, and since that day, Ahriman has sought ever more powerful artifacts to increase his understanding of the warp. One source of lore that has always eluded him is the Black Library, a vast repository of ancient secrets collated by the Eldar and gathered together in a hidden place unknown to the eyes of man. Only those pure of heart and with the strength of mind to comprehend the scale of such awful knowledge may enter this place and sup from its wisdom. And my master was one such individual. Araman has long sought Inquisitor Saivak in order to wrest the knowledge of the Black Library from his mind. But though cunning and machination, my master has thus far eluded his nemesis. But recent developments lead me to believe that the dread sorcerer has finally caught up with him. A savant in my employ, having accessed secret files of the Ordo Malleus regarding Ahriman, was recently found dead, and psychometric readings revealed an individual who could be none other than Araman himself as his killer. A number of other incidents, at first glance unconnected, but upon further scrutiny linked in the subtlest of ways, all point to the same dire conclusion. My master's last contact was in the region of space known as the Sentinel Worlds, and it is here that I shall begin my search. I shall investigate further, but it seems clear to me that Araman of the Thousand Suns has ensnared Inquisitor Sivak. If this proves to be the case, then I urge you to use whatever power you can bring to bear on this matter and dispatch all force that can be gathered to hunt down this heretic sorcerer and stop him before he achieves whatever nefarious plan he intends to implement. Yours in desperate need, Kairas. <laughs> How's that? Oh, and there's a little response, sorry. It says right underneath in a little post-it note. Sweet merciful emperor, the secrets of the Black Library unlocked by the sorcerer of the Red Cyclops? Better that Sivak has perished to some foul Xenos creature than fall into his clutches. I shall mobilize the 34th Gudrunite Rifles and petition the chapter master of the Iron Hands for his warrior's aid. I pray I am not too late. <laughs> Until next time. Bye.